name is Sean Smuckler. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. In the first part, I'm going to talk about applied research to support agricultural producer adaptation to climate change. Then I'm going to talk about an overview of the complexity of, of this, this problem and the need for a multidisciplinary approach. And finally, I'm going to introduce uh, a provincial network approach that we've started for uh, climate change adaptation research and discuss some opportunities for the future. Around the world, we expect that climate change is going to have substantial impacts on agriculture. Some examples of those impacts are an increase in temperatures, which in some places is likely to improve crop productivity, while in others, depending on the crop, cause failure. It's likely to increase weather volatility. It's likely to shift precipitation patterns. So in some places, things will get wetter, in some places drier in different times of the year. It's likely to shift pest populations. So insects will be in places that they've never been seen before or weeds in new locations. And it's likely to contribute to sea level rise, which for low-lying agricultural regions around the world can have substantial impact. So when we talk about adaptation, we're really talking about how to improve the function of, uh, of the farm in the face of some of these challenges. So when we think about function, you can see on the, the y-axis we have a, a level of function, and then on the x-axis we have some projection of time. And over time we see a disturbance, and if that disturbance impacts the function of the farm dramatically, it drops the function and that farm is deemed vulnerable. What we'd like to see is an improvement in the farm's function to the point where when we have that disturbance, the function may drop, but then return to its original state of function, and that farm would be deemed resilient. What we're really looking for is a situation where the farm is actually resistant to any sort of disturbance. So there are many strategies that can be employed to help farmers to adapt to these uh, various impacts that we're expecting. Um, some examples of, of adaptation strategies might include improvements in infrastructure. So here we're uh, showing a picture of uh, a farmer installing drainage that uh, helps deal with shifting precipitation patterns. We could provide farmers with additional information. The more information farmers have about the changes that are expected, the more likely they'll be able to adapt effectively. There are a whole range of technologies that are already online or coming online that could help farmers adapt, like this tractor being fitted with uh, GPS units that connects to satellites, enabling the farmer to uh, very precisely run their operations, increasing the farm efficiency. And then there's a whole suite of adaptive management strategies that might actually rely on these other uh, strategies of infrastructure and information and technology that enables the farmer to respond quickly to any sort of uh, perturbation in the system. And then there may be some economic strategies. So certainly farmers who, are, uh, who have the capital or the resources are more likely to be able to uh, to deal with any sort of impacts to their farming systems. So let's talk about the role of, uh, of research in trying to enhance farmers' capabilities to adapt to climate change. And when we talk about research, we're, we're thinking about two principal categories, either basic research or applied research. When we talk about basic research, this is really aiming to improve scientific theories or our understanding of uh, or prediction of natural or other phenomena. Whereas applied research is really designed to, uh, to use those scientific theory or models to develop technologies or techniques, strategies to actually intervene and alter uh, the, the natural or other phenomenon that we see. So, when we, when we think of the process of applied research, it, 
it, this is sort of a, a depiction of the idealistic way or the ideal way that we might develop a research program. So we would first try to identify and prioritize the research questions. We definitely need to acquire the funding. We need to be able to provide the, the scientific evidence to answer these questions. And we can do this in a variety of ways. For example, we can do this on farm, which has a number of benefits, but is also very challenging, particularly when we're trying to deal with uh, the active operations of a, of, uh, of a real farm. Or we could do this on an experimental station where we have much more control over the, the environmental conditions and the management, but may not be as realistic as what's happening on the, on the real farm. We can also do experiments in the laboratory where we have very tight control over uh, the environment. Or we can even do things from a desktop. So we could be engaged in modeling or literature reviews or uh, large scale uh, global type analysis. It's really critical that we take this information and be able to share it in a way that's, that's most useful. And for many of us as scientists, this, this final step is one of the biggest challenges. And in theory, step number four then returns back to the original step of identifying and reprioritizing new research questions. So really, when we're thinking about where applied research goes, it's an interaction between the farmer, the scientist, or any other decision maker that the, uh, the research is, is geared towards. And it really has to have some type of feedback loop in order to be effective. So I'm gonna give an example of some applied research that I've been involved in in Delta, British Columbia. So Delta, British Columbia is in the southwest part of the province. It's principally dominated by the production of vegetables, berries. It's also an important uh, habitat for migrating waterfowl. One of the major challenges farmers in this region are already starting to see is shifting precipitation patterns. In this photo, um, my team was out taking soil samples while in the background you can see a farmer desperately trying to get their crop out of the field in the foreground here, you can see the damage that was done to the soil when the farmer put their massive tractor on this saturated soil to try to harvest their crop. This type of damage, this compaction that's done on saturated soils, takes a very long time to, to remediate, potentially causing uh, long-term impacts to the farming operation. So, in general, in, in, in this region, farmers try to uh, have their mechanized operations done in a period of time when the soil was dry enough to put their heavy equipment on without causing damage. In the shoulder seasons, this is when in the spring we see uh, farmers trying to prepare their fields or uh, in the fall when farmers are trying to harvest their crops. And in this graph, we show uh, the historic precipitation for Delta from 1960 to 2014, and then the three years that we actually were working on this study. And what you'll see is in this, uh, the arrow depicts where uh, the precipitation was much higher than historic averages. What happens then is that the farmers are uh, either forced to delay the preparation of their crops and uh, push their operation into the, the summertime, which then affects the possibility of getting in to their fields in the fall when the precipitation patterns are starting to actually creep in into the October and November months. So the dry period where we can get our heavy equipment on the fields, we call the number of workable days. And what we're worried about is those number of workable days could uh, dramatically uh, be lowered in a climate change future. So this is one of the, uh, the challenges that the Climate Action Initiative had identified through their workshops and their interactions with farmers in the region. And 
this is one of the situations where this is a, uh, we had the opportunity to really have an idealized interaction with the farmers to create the research questions that they really were interested in asking. So through Climate Action Initiative's primary work, we then were able to identify particular users to interact with, particular farmers, and we had the opportunity to run a survey to actually ask the farmers what their challenges primarily were. And in this survey, we asked a whole suite of questions, but one of the, the key questions was is whether or not they had concern about drainage. And overwhelmingly, almost 80% of the farmers surveyed suggested that drainage was a, a really important challenge for them. The other challenge that farmers identified were, was salinity. So uh, a, a challenge that comes along with poor drainage is the buildup of salts in the soil. Highly saline salts then really reduce the capacity of the farmer to, to grow their crop. So when we look at the trends from uh, 1961 to 2016, we see that uh, three-day storm events are uh, increasing over, over time. So we've, we've long known that there's a, a very simple technology to deal with this problem. So tile drainage is a, a technology that's used around the world. Basically, we install a perforated plastic tube uh, roughly 60 centimeters below the soil surface. And we do this in, a, uh, in an incline so that the, the water that is in the saturated soil drains through those pipes into nearby open ditches. It's really important, however, that the, the ditch water goes somewhere. You can imagine that if you don't have that water go someplace and the ditch fills up, that water actually can move back up into the drainage tile and serve as a, an irrigation, something that you don't necessarily want during the winter time. So we worked with uh, a number of farmers down in Delta to try to address their, their research questions about drainage and salinity. And one of the big challenges with installing this type of infrastructure is uh, the fact that it is extremely expensive. When we surveyed the farmers, almost 60% of them said that they would either be very interested or would potentially be interested in installing this type of tile drain system. The big hurdle for farmers to, to make this, uh, this choice, however, is the cost. This is an extremely expensive infrastructure uh, to install. And there are different uh, spacings that farmers could, uh, could use to, to address their drainage problems. Certainly the farmer is likely to choose the, the most effective in terms of both cost and outcome of, uh, of workable days. So what we did was we worked with a particular farmer in Delta where we were able to set up a number of different uh, trials to look at different spacings for their, uh, their drainage system. We had an area where we had a, a control, we had no tile drain. We had tile drain installed at 60 feet, we had tile at 30 feet, and then tile which is extremely unusual in the area at a spacing of only 15 feet. So most farmers in the region have their tile either at 60 or 30 feet. And then we had an area that had either grassland set aside or cover crop, an additional treatment. And in addition to this uh, on-farm experiment, we looked at how tile drains were performing across the region. So we worked with a, a number of different farmers um, on almost 30 fields across the region looking at uh, fields that had no tile drains, some that had what we call the big O tile, and big O with pump. So remember I told you that if that water drains out into the nearby uh, ditch and doesn't go anywhere, it can be problematic. So the pump is a way that we can actually get water from the field out into uh, the nearby waterways. 
So when we talk about workability, we're really trying to uh, develop a situation where the soil is dry enough to get this heavy equipment on. And this is determined really by how much uh, that uh, soil can hold in terms of water. And that's a function of both the soil organic matter and the texture, particularly the clay in the soil. In the, the season where precipitation was typical, in the spring of 2016, we saw clear differences between the fields that had drains and pumps and the fields that had no drains. In the, uh, the fall and the spring, of uh, in the fall of 2016 and the spring of 2017, precipitation was much higher than usual. And that's where the differences really uh, disappeared, really indicating that the farms around Delta are not well prepared for increased precipitation patterns. And in fact, when we look at this dotted line, this shows uh, at what stage the fields are dry enough to actually get uh, heavy equipment on the field. You can see that in the in the wetter seasons in the fall of 2016 and 20 and the spring of 2017, there's very few uh, very few times that we measured that the the field was actually workable. And then when we did an analysis where we looked at overall the the difference in workability, we showed that there are statistically significant differences in the fields with drains and pumps and drains as opposed to the ones with no drains. So uh, we clearly illustrated that you can increase your, uh, the number of workable days. The question is, is by, by how much and how does this change in terms of uh, a changing climate? So some of the, the project outcomes we uh, identified, as I said, that drains and pumps are effective. Uh, we were produced a number of fact sheets that illustrated some of the other uh, key outcomes of that project. We have four fact sheets designed to translate some of the, the complex analysis that we did into information that the farmers uh, would likely find interesting and might, might uh, be able to use. Uh, we produced a report that would hopefully have impact on some uh, of the, the policy around this, this, uh, this challenge. And then we held a number of producer workshops that was designed to actually inter interact with the, the farmers.